My names are Omalo Frederick Okanda. I teach biology at Bokolsun High School, which is situated in Kamkunji constituency. Today, I'll make a continuation of the topic of uh, support and movement. And the main subtopic that I'll start off with will be joints. We'll start off by definition, then look at uh, various types of joints, their locations, and the types of bones that form the joints. So by definition, a joint is a connection point where two or more bones meet. There are several types of joints, but we'll summarize the several types of joints into two broad categories. The first category of the joints will be immovable joints, then the second category, movable joints. So let's start off with immovable joints. So an immovable joint is a joint or a point where two or more bones meet and there is no movement experienced at that particular point where the two bones or several bones come into contact. One of the immovable joints, as per the diagram that I've displayed, are the sutures of the skull. The human skull is made up of many different types of bones, and those bones are usually connected at specific points. For example, on this particular diagram, you can see the bones that form cranium or skull marked in different types of colors. We have one marked in green color, another one blue, brown, yellow, purple. These particular bones are connected at specific points. For example, the blue part, which represents a bone, is connected to the bone marked yellow through this particular part or joint. This joint is immovable. There's also another joint between the bone marked in blue and the bone marked in brown. There's a joint here. So the joints of cranium or skull are immovable. So immovable joints, example, sutures of cranium. or skull. Another immovable joint will be found on the pelvic girdle, the bone that is found at the waist. Within the pelvic girdle, as per the diagram displayed, we know that the pelvic girdle is made up of two halves, one half on the left side another half on the right hand side. These two halves of the pelvic girdle are joined at a specific point here, which is known as pubis symphysis. Pubis symphysis is a connection point where the left side of the pelvic girdle and the right side of the pelvic girdle are joined. At this particular point, there is no movement. So we call that type of joint immovable joint. Then, each half of the pelvic girdle is made up of three different types of bones. We have ilium, marked in yellow. Then we have pubis, marked in brown. And ischium, marked in purple. These three types of bones are also connected at specific points where there are no movements. For example, ischium and pubis, there's a joint here. There's another joint here. At those particular joints, there is no movement. Between uh, ischium and ilium, there's also this joint. At this particular joint, no movement is experienced. So those are immovable joints. So, the main immovable joints that we've talked about are the immovable joint of the cranium and the immovable joints of the pelvic girdle. Then we look at uh, movable joints.
Movable joints are connection points where two or more bones meet and there is some movement experience within those particular points where two or more bones meet. So movable joints are of several different types. One of them is gliding joint or if there are many gliding joints. So we have two main categories of movable joints. That is points where two or more bones meet and there is some movement experienced. The degree of movement at the movable joints vary from one type of movable joint to another. We have gliding joints, we have synovial joints. Synovial joints are named so because of the presence of synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is a colorless fluid that is found at the point or sections where two or more bones meet and mainly serves as lubricating fluid. Synovial joints are of two types. First one, hinge joints. and ball and socket joints. So, I'll pick on gliding joints, explain, give examples, then we come to synovial joints. Gliding joints are connective points where we have two or more bones articulating with each other to form a joint upon which bones slide over each other. Gliding or sliding joints are found at the wrist, at the wrist there is gliding joint formed between distal surface of radius and ulna and couples. of the palm. So, at the wrist we have the bone which is found on the lower side of the small finger and the bone that is found on the side of the thumb. The bone that is found on the side of the thumb is known as radius. The bone that is found on the lower side of the small finger is known as ulna. At their terminal ends, they are joined together to form a smooth surface called distal surface. So we have a distal surface here. That distal surface articulates with small pieces of bones which are found at the wrist. So at this particular joint, we have distal surface of radius and ulna sliding over small pieces of bones of the wrist known as carpals. So we also have another sliding joint or gliding joint at the ankle. At the ankle we have a bone that is found on the side of the big toe known as tibia. and the bone that is found on the side of the small toe known as fibula. At their terminal ends, they are also in contact with one another. At their terminal ends, they articulate with small pieces of bones that are found at the ankle. Small pieces of bone found at the ankle are known as tassels. So, the posterior terminal end of tibia and fibula articulate with bones at the ankle known as tassels to form a sliding joint at the ankle. So we have a sliding joint at the ankle. Then the last type of sliding joint is between the vertebra. Vertebra are small pieces of bones that are found from the neck region to the tail region. In between the vertebra there are articular discs. Those articular discs enable each vertebra to, sli to slide slightly. 
upon each other. So when they slide, they enable us to bend or stretch. So gliding joints or sliding joints, specific positions at the wrist, at the ankle, and between the vertebra. Those particular joints experience movement upon which bones slide over each other. That's all about the first category of sliding joints or gliding joints. The next category of joints that we look into will be synovial joints, which is still under the category of movable joints. So the second type of movable joints, synovial joints. Synovial joints are named so because of a fluid, the lubricating fluid that is found within those joints. The lubricating fluid here is synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is located within a space known as synovial cavity. And synovial fluid itself is secreted by synovial membrane. Synovial joints are of two types. First one, hinge joints. And because there are many hinge joints, two, ball and socket joints. I'll display diagrams to show you the types of the, I mean the two types of joints along with synovial fluid, synovial membrane, synovial cavity, etc. So this, this is a generalized diagram of synovial joint. At the synovial joint, we have synovial cavity. Within synovial cavity, we have synovial fluid. So synovial fluid is located inside synovial cavity. Then we have synovial membrane, which is this. This blue part here, synovial membrane. Synovial membrane is the one that secretes synovial fluid. At the terminal ends of bones that form a joint, there is articular cartilage, which is this. Articular cartilage ensures that the two bones that form a joint do not come into contact with one another. Because if the bones come into contact with one another, bones are made up of living cells, they can crash against each other, and that can cause severe pain when an individual is walking or moving. So articular cartilage ensures that bones do not come into contact with one another. So articular cartilage in this case serves as shock absorber. So articular cartilage serves as shock absorber, ensuring that two bones at a joint do not come into contact with one another. Then, jo bones within a joint are usually attached indirectly to one another by thread-like structures known as ligaments. So you have ligaments here attaching one bone to the other bone. So we call them ligaments. So ligaments ensure that during movements, bones do not get out of their original position. So bones will get out of position, but then later on, get back to where they were. So in short, ligaments ensure that bones remain in particular positions during movement and even after movement. Then, let's look at specific types of uh, synovial joints. This was just a general diagram to show uh, position of synovial cavity, synovial membrane, articular cartilage, and their functions or roles. So let's speak on hinge joints. Hinge joints are connective points where two or more bones meet and 
they can experience movement up to a maximum of 180 degrees. So bones that form hinge joints can only stretch up to maximum of 180 and they move in one plane. Movement is experienced in one plane or simply one direction. At the hinge joint, we have several types of hinge joints. One, we have hinge joints between the bones that form the phalanges. The phalanges of the arm, we have these ones that form our fingers. We also have phalanges that form the toes. So between I mean, within each and every phalange, we have small pieces of bones, like here's a bone, another bone, another bone. Here we have three bones, for example, in this middle finger. Then, in between the bones, there is a joint. So this is the hinge joint, another hinge joint. A joint that can only allow movement in one particular direction. Another hinge joint is found at the elbow. So at the elbow, we have the bone of the upper arm, known as humerus. The bone that is found on the side of the thumb, radius. Bone that is found on the side of the small finger, ulna. So humerus fits into a depression, a depression that is located within ulna. That depression is known as sigmoid notch. So it, it is within the sigmoid notch where humerus fits in to form hinge joint at the elbow. Fine. So, there is a diagram displayed here. On this particular diagram, we have bone of the upper arm, which is humerus, and then bone that is located on the lower side, that is towards the small finger, or on the side of the small finger, ulna. Then ulna has a depression, a part that curves inwards. This part that curves inwards is what we call sigmoid notch. So this curved part is sigmoid notch. So the lower part or the posterior part of humerus, this section here is called trochlea. This way too big. Trochlea, then sigmoid notch. So Sigmoid notch is this part that curves in. So the whole of this is ulna, but the part of ulna that curves in is what we call sigmoid notch. The posterior terminal end of humerus is called trochlea. So trochlea fits into sigmoid notch to form hinge joint at the elbow, a joint that can only move in one particular direction this. So that's hinge joint. Assuming that radius and ulna could lie flat onto humerus, then say this is zero degrees. Then when it turns to stretch to the maximum limit, that would be an, a, a stretch of 180 degrees. The advantage of hinge joint over ball and socket joint is that hinge joints can bear heavy weights without dislocation. So we say we have hinge joints at the elbows between humerus, then radius and ulna. Another hinge joint found between the phalanges, the bones that form the phalanges, both of the fingers and the toes. Then the last type of hinge joint found at the knee. So at the knees we also have hinge joints. The bone of the thigh is known as Femur. Then the bones of the lower part of the leg, we have a bone that's found on the side of the big toe, tibia, bone found on the left of the small toe, fibula. So femur, tibia, and fibula also form a joint at the knee.
Okay. So at the knee we have hinge joint between femur, tibia, and fibula. The bone, the joint formed at the knee can also stretch up to a maximum of 180 degrees and not beyond. And that marks the end of the synovial joints as far as hinge joints are concerned. Then the last type of synovial joints will be ball and socket joints. In this type of joint, what is referred to as the, as the ball is the smooth round head section of a bone. What is referred to as a socket is a depression, a part that curves in on another bone. So ball, which is a round section of one bone, fits into a depression, which is a curved in section of another bone. I'll display a diagram there to show ball and socket joint. So on this diagram, we have femur, which is this. Femur is the thigh bone. The thigh bone has a smooth round head. This smooth round head is the one that is referred to as the ball. Then, on the hip, pelvic girdle, there is a part that curves in. That section of the hip bone or pelvic girdle that curves in is known as acetabulum. Acetabulum. So, this is the hip bone, hip bone, or simply known as pelvic girdle, the whole of it, pelvic girdle. On the pelvic girdle, there's a part that curves in. This section that curves in is the one that we say is known as socket. Then on the thigh bone, there's a smooth round head that fits into the socket called acetabulum to form hinge joint of the hip. So hinge joint of the hip region is between smooth round head of femur, thigh bone, and acetabulum of the pelvic girdle. Then, at the point where two or more bones come into contact, like in this case, at the ball and socket joint of the hip region, which at this point we have the we have the thread-like structures, which you say are known as ligaments. So ligaments are found here. For example, the ligament on the upper part is attached to this section called greater trochanter. On the lower side, we have lesser trochanter. So greater trochanter and lesser trochanter on the lower side provide surfaces for attachment of ligaments. Ligaments will attach one bone onto another. Like in this case, we have the ligaments attaching femur to the pelvic girdle on the upper part. Then we can also see there are some ligaments on the lower side, which still attaches pelvic girdle to the femur. So at those particular joints, we have ligaments attaching bones at the particular joints. Next type of uh, ball and socket joint is found at the shoulder. So at the shoulder, we have bone of the upper part of the arm. That bone is known as humerus. Humerus, which is bone of the upper part of the arm, has smooth round head. That smooth round head fits into a depression that is found on the scapula. The depression found on the scapula provides socket upon which head of humerus fits in. So at the shoulder, we have ball and socket joint between glenoid cavity, glenoid cavity of scapula and head of humerus. So scapula is bone that is found at the shoulder and extends to the lower part of the back, which is this, extends to the lower part of the back. It has a depression known as 
glenoid cavity. Then humerus, which is born of the upper part of the arm, has a smooth round head. That smooth round head fits into glenoid cavity to form ball and socket joint at the shoulder. The advantage of ball and socket joints over hinge joints is that ball and socket joints, the bones can move in all directions. Even the one at the hip, leg can move in all different directions. It is assumed that the bones can turn 360 degrees. The disadvantage of ball and socket joints is that the bones at the joints can easily get dislocated when an individual lifts a heavy load. So when a heavy load is lifted, it's easier for one of the bones to get out of its original position and fail to come back. And that is what we call dislocation, which causes a lot of pain. That brings us to the end of the subtopic of joints. In summary, a joint is a connection point between two or more bones. There are joints that experience movements and there are joints where no movement is experienced. That brings us to two categories of joints, movable and immovable joints. In immovable joints, sections or points where two or more bones meet and there is no movement, like the ones that are found on the cranium, we call them satuous. Then we have movable joints. Movable joints are points where two or more, bone, bone, more bones meet and they experience either slight movement or great movement. We say there are two types. We have sliding joints and then synovial joints. Sliding joints of the wrist, sliding joint between the vertebra, sliding joint at the ankle. Then synovial joints, they are named synovial because of the fluid known as synovial fluid which is secreted by synovial membrane. Synovial fluid serves as a lubricant, thereby reducing friction when bones move at the particular joints. Synovial joints are of two types. Hinge joints at the elbow, between our fingers, and our toes, known as phalanges. We also have hinge joints at the knee. Then ball and socket joints, at the shoulder, at the hip region. Then the next subtopic would be um, movements at a joint, or movement at a joint. If you have the KLB book, old edition, you can respond to page 127. To 128. It also has details about joints. So next subtopic that we look into will be movement at a joint. How does movement take place at a particular joint? So. movement at a joint. Fine. Before we talk about movement at a joint, there are some terms that we'll use uh, more often, and I want, to know, I want to introduce those terms, like tendon, ligament, flex the muscles, extends the muscles, yeah. So, a tendon, a tendon, ligament, flexor muscles, extends the muscles, those are terms that you use more often concerning movements at a joint. So, a tendon is a thread-like structure which is inelastic and it's made up of collagen fibers. Since it's made up of collagen fibers and it is inelastic, it attaches bones to the muscles. 
That means bones are not attached, I mean muscles are not attached to the bones directly, but instead they lie on the bones and then the muscles themselves are attached to the bones through these inelastic collagen fibers known as tendons. Ligaments are inelastic collagen fibers that attach one bone to another at a joint. So, tendons attach muscles to the bones, ligaments attach one bone to another at a particular joint. I'll display some diagrams to show tendons and ligaments later. Then you have flexor muscles. Flexor muscles are those muscles that bring about stretching of bones at a particular joint. I mean bending of bones at a particular joint. Then extensor muscles bring about stretching. So we have two types of muscles. Let me display them. Yeah. From the diagram of the elbow, we have two types of muscles. Biceps on the front upper part, triceps, the back part of the humerus. We said the bone that is found on the upper part of the arm is known as humerus, which is this. Then the bone has two muscles attached to it. On the front side, we have biceps back part we have triceps. Biceps are called flexor muscles. They bring about bending at the joint. Then we have triceps which are found on the back part of the humerus. Triceps bring about stretching of bones at the joint. These two types of muscles work in opposite ways. The muscles that work in opposite ways are known as antagonistic. Antagonistic muscles. So the antagonistic muscles at the joint are the ones that will bring about bending and stretching of the joint. Let me pick on one specific example of movement that takes place at a joint and explain it in full. One, when the when the arm is to bend, let's assume the arm is stretched this way. So if the arm is to bend, then biceps will contract. When the biceps contract, the triceps relax. Radius and ulna bend. So in short, bending of the arm is brought about by contraction of the biceps, flexor muscles, and relaxation of the triceps, extensor muscles. Once the arm has bent, then if it's to stretch, then biceps, which are the flexor muscles, will relax. And then triceps, which are extensor muscles, will contract. So when triceps contract and biceps relax, the arm stretches. That means radius and ulna move away from humerus, and that brings about bending and stretching. During the process of bending and stretching at the elbow, or the cranon process, which is this extended part of ulna, serves as fulcrum or turning point. So this extended lower part of ulna is what is known as the cranon process. Or the cranon process, in that case, we serve as turning point or fulcrum. At this particular joint, we have talked about ligaments. And we said ligaments are inelastic collagen fibers. These inelastic structures, ligaments, attach humerus to olecranon process part of ulna. On the upper part, we also have radius connected to the same humerus by ligaments. So the ligaments will ensure that bones are in particular positions during movements and even after movements. Because without the ligaments, then what would happen is the bones would get out of their normal position and that would lead to severe pain 
a condition that we refer to as dislocation. Then we have tendons. We have tendons of biceps here and tendons of triceps. So the triceps are attached to tendons which are further attached to ulna. That means the muscles of triceps do not have direct contact with the ulna, but instead they are connected to the ulna by tendons of triceps. On the upper part, we have tendons of biceps. The tendons of biceps attach biceps to the radius. So tendons in elastic thread-like structures which are made of collagen but are flexible. They're inelastic but flexible. They attach muscles to the bones. And that's all about movement at a joint using hinge joint of the elbow as specific example of movement at a joint.